Previously on the West Indies at War The men of the British West Indies Regiment finally get the opportunity to show what they're made of in theatres of war in Egypt and the Western Front. But no effort seems great enough to shield them from discrimination. And with the war finally coming to an end, they face uncertain futures. Time, those who come after us will reap its golden fruit. And some of them have given their lives for this new world. God rest their souls. Are we going to let them down? No. We are going to be brave, good men and true. The old regime and all that it stands for must go. Captain Arthur Cipriani. The First World War changed the direction of everything. Business was not going to be as usual after that First World War ended. The long shadow of war continues to shroud the world months after the last shot is fired. Soldiers finally retreat after years of entrenchment. An eerie silence echoes across all fronts. Although the fighting had come to an end in late 1918, the war officially ends on the 28th of June 1919 with the signing of the Treaty of Versailles in France. The 441 articles of the treaty bring the defeated Central Powers to their knees. Germany, Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Turks are forced to cede territories, reimburse enormous sums of money to the Allies and demobilize all their remaining armed forces. The Allies won. The German Empire went down in ruins. A republic was established. I think we all know that Hitler came out of that, that situation. Um, the Austrian Empire went down in ruins and all the independent countries which had previously been provinces of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire were created in the aftermath of um, World War I. The Ottoman Empire went down and we had a carving out of the Middle Eastern provinces with results that are still with us today, while Turkey itself, the heartland of the old empire, became the Republic of Turkey as it is today. In accordance with the Treaty of Versailles, the Ottoman Empire is dismantled. Jordan, Iraq and Palestine are mandated to Britain and Syria and Lebanon are mandated to France. Germany bears the brunt of the punishments handed down by the Allies. The treaty places sole blame for the entire war on Germany and stipulates a sum of 226 billion Reichsmarks as retribution to the Allies. Germany lost territory too, particularly in Africa. Germany forfeits 13% of her territories within Europe and all overseas colonies which are handed over as mandated territories to Britain, France, Australia and South Africa. The stripping of Germany of its colonies suggested Germany was a loser, uh, blaming Germany for war crime, so it was made to look hideous. The dismembering of parts of Europe and the emergence of new nations and so on suggested that they were held by people who, against their will, so these seemed to be the victors. But that victory did not last too long because then World War II occurred, and World War I was certainly a contributor to the outbreak of World War II 
you know, German wound, wounded pride was something that could not be contained uh, beyond, you know, 1939. We all blame Germany now, but the Germans didn't start it. And if anybody started it, that damn little fool, Gavrilo Princip, the schoolboy who murdered the um, Jews. Indeed, it was this punitive response of the Allies that brought about the precipitous crash of the German economy, clearing the way for the arrival of Adolf Hitler on the scene. First of all, I don't think that uh, a war has really a winner. Uh, we have all the losers in the war. All the people who died, the families behind it, the sad situation for everybody. I think there was no real winner of this war. All the economies were down after the war. As the dust begins to settle, the realities of living in a post-war world become clear. Within Britain's vast empire, frustrations over the lack of political representation, economic decline and a shortage of jobs prompt unrest in Africa, India and the West Indies. In Russia, the Bolshevik Revolution introduces communism to Europe and Marxist ideas are rippling around the world. What you see, the, the First World War is, is very important for the Caribbean because these black uh, West Indians who went and, and stayed in the various theaters of war um, as members of the British West India Regiment they were there at, in Europe when very important things were happening which opened their eyes. For example, there was a Russian Revolution in 1917. It was a world-shaking event. And they were there in Europe seeing what was happening all the time, hearing about the dictatorship of the proletariat, which they were, and the overthrowing of, of centuries of Tsarist. They're in Europe, they're in the Middle East, they are in contact with broader world trends. The Bolshevik Revolution, 1917, they read about it. They learnt about socialism, communism, Marx, Lenin. UNIA, Garvey's organization, was, was taking off. Um, it reached its peak in 1919-1920, just when the troops were returning home from World War I. So when they came back to the Caribbean, I mean, that, that's, that's where the thunder started. Between June and September 1919, the men of the British West Indies Regiment are finally demobilized and sent home. The streets of various towns throughout the Caribbean are decorated with flags and banners welcoming the men home. Bright, cheerful processions of returning soldiers march through the towns. Governors make their speeches congratulating the men for their service. But lurking beneath this joyous veneer is an angst that permeates the battalions of returning soldiers around the region. The Taranto mutiny and the race riots in England loom large in the minds of the local authorities. In the aftermath of the Taranto mutiny, a group of Jamaican non-commissioned officers, particularly sergeants, created an organization called the Caribbean League, the sort of political social organization led by Jamaican sergeants, whose aim was, when they returned to Jamaica, to agitate for a better deal for ex-soldiers, to agitate to the, for the vote for all Jamaican men, and to agitate generally for, towards self-government. The returning veterans definitely had an anti-white feeling. It would have been more pronounced in some individuals than in others, but their experiences in the war had um, made them see that black and brown people were not treated on an equal basis. There was resentment there. And we need to factor in, in the course of 1919, there were horrible race riots in Britain itself. Four years of war have left England devastated. On one hand, there was a shortage of jobs and on the other, a substantial foreign community who had come to help the war effort now seemed to be settling in. 
But with the war over, these recent arrivals were seen as competition for jobs, housing and limited public funds. Mobs of white men, this is during the course of 1919, many of them unemployed and in hard times, turned on black residents of these cities as an visible and obvious target. Their argument was they're taking the jobs that belong to us. Some of these black men were born in Britain. Cities like Liverpool and Cardiff had a long established black population going back to the late 19th century. Some had come during World War I as laborers, wartime laborers or as soldiers and were planning to go back home. It didn't matter to the white mobs. Men were killed, um, there was considerable destruction of property. There was a group of West Indians who came to um, Wales. They, they, they were in Cardiff, en route to the Caribbean, from the theatres of war, waiting to be transported in the Caribbean. And, and, and there were race riots because the, the English people didn't want these black West Indians in their city. They couldn't go to the pubs. They couldn't go and get services like barbering. They couldn't come in their groceries. So that there was considerable violence against black West Indians who had been temporarily stationed in Cardiff. The black troops had put up with bad treatment for four years so far. I mean, the war was already over. They were being demobbed. They perhaps were beginning to suspect that, no, they weren't going to get any help when they got back home. They certainly weren't going home wealthy. They, they hadn't been given an opportunity to learn a trade. They hadn't been allowed to be war heroes. And they were just completely fed up. This was a war for freedom. This was a war for democracy. Didn't work out like that, but that was the propaganda. And then most important, I think, for many West Indian men was the sense that if you volunteered, you fought in the war, you made the sacrifices, at the end of the war, you could no longer be treated as third-class subjects of the emperor. You had made a claim for equality on the basis of your service when the emperor was desperate for men, on the basis of your sacrifices, so that at the end of the war, it was confidently expected Britain would move towards a completely new colonial policy. But far from equality, the troops of the BWIR are met with suspicion and mistrust by local authorities in the Caribbean. As the troops disembark in Jamaica, a warship and military guard are stationed on the wharf to ensure there's no trouble. The Barbadian governor refuses to admit military prisoners from the Toronto Mutiny when they arrive in Barbados in September 1919. I don't think returning soldiers felt proud. I, I think they were very um, disenchanted with the war experience on the fighting front. And they were going home with a particular kind of bitterness. Also with an expectation, because having been discriminated on the, on, on the fighting front, they wondered now what would happen when they got home to get the rewards they expected. And again, they were disappointed. So at the end of it all, they were very bitter people, and this is why they became so militant. West Indian soldiers return home to a tense atmosphere. The cost of living is high, and jobs are scarce. During the war years, sugar and cocoa had experienced a boom of sorts, but peace ends the boom. The supply of goods and services was really related primarily to the sugar industry. The raw product was exported to the colonizer, refined there and resold elsewhere. And sometimes back to the colony to themselves uh, at a price that most couldn't afford. In the case of Trinidad, uh, there was a cocoa industry which grew and Trinidad produced fine quality cocoa so the market was extremely good. Trinidad and Tobago notwithstanding, the rest of the Caribbean is still economically tethered to sugar. Then in 1920 and 21, prices for sugar, cocoa and other tropical commodities crash on the world market. Meanwhile, the Caribbean is still a net importer of food supplies. Because the plantation system told us, taught us that we didn't have to produce for ourselves. We were, we were to, to, to live by what, what 
what the European countries were sending for us. You know, potatoes, what they call Irish potatoes. And we had abundant fisheries around, but we couldn't catch our own fish. We had to import salt fish and smoke herring from North America, Canada. So that it was a whole artificial economy dependent, dependent on European produce. But the declining profitability of sugar and cocoa, coupled with the increasingly high cost of living, are taking a toll on West Indians. Wages nowhere kept pace with the inflation in basic goods. Many West Indians emigrate to other islands, to England, the United States and Canada, in search of work and a better life. Uriah Butler moves from Grenada to Trinidad and Tobago. Political organizers, many of whom come from the ranks of the BWIR, start to activate. In 1919, there are very serious strikes and disturbances in the Caribbean, led again by Trinidad, and when British warships have to come and patrol Port of Spain and, and keep, as I said, keep the niggers under control. The Jamaican government tries to avoid possible trouble by paying returning soldiers to head straight home on arrival in Kingston. However, on July the 18th, 1919, a riot led by ex-servicemen and seamen breaks out in the country's capital. It is quickly quelled by sailors stationed on a nearby ship. It becomes clear that soldiers around the region are in no mood for a peaceable return to the status quo. On the 19th of July in Port of Spain, Trinidad, some ex-servicemen in civilian clothes riot during the Peace Day celebrations and white sailors from the HMS Dartmouth are attacked. In Belize, ex-servicemen are also protesting their mistreatment during the war. White-owned businesses in Belize City are looted and destroyed. The superintendent of the Belize police would later report, they were carrying sticks and shouting, my intention was to prevail on the contingent men. I went right amongst them and appealed to them to stop. Something like this, for God's sake men, do not do this, you will get a bad name. No sooner were these words out of my mouth than a contingent man struck me with a stick right on the left shoulder and somebody shouted out, beat it, you white bastard, to the station, beat it to the station. A number of contingent men then set about me with sticks. During the time I was being beaten, the civilians standing by jeered and laughed and danced. Three months later, an ex-serviceman's protest outside an immigration office in Jamaica grows violent and white sailors are targeted. Fifteen rioters are arrested and charged. Soon, the Trinidad Working Men's Association organizes a strike in an attempt to negotiate pay increases for the dock workers, overtime pay and an eight-hour day. Frustrated workers attack the warehouses and assault scab workers. The strike is later joined by city council employees and coal carriers. And before long, the colonial office has a nationwide strike on its hands. 99 protesters are arrested, 82 of whom would be convicted and imprisoned. At the end of the war, in fact, in 1918, you know, that was a stark moment, I think, for the British government to realize that her colonial territories and, and her colonial people were no longer willing to be treated differently when they were on the line fighting for what they thought of as their country, being patriotic, being loyal, and yet being shown that they were absolutely not equal. And what you had then was a buildup in the islands of people who had no work, and who were explosive, you know, who, who were not the same people who were leaving in, at the turn of the century. They, they, had, they were different because of the exposure to ideas and to war. They were more sophisticated, more aware of what is happening in the rest of the world. Because let's face it, up to the 19th century, people were very much locked into their little islands, their little plantations. They were rural based for the most part. Um, the means of communication was by song or word of mouth. Um, but in the post-war years, uh, more people were educated too, 
where people were able to read. There were organs like Garvey's papers. There were all kinds of radical movements playing out in all the islands of the Caribbean. Um, and there, were, there was a working class movement, a labor movement began, where people started to organize. So it was just a time of fantastic um, social ferment, really. UNIA branches throughout the West Indies, throughout Latin America, everywhere, became the means by which people were able to, to come together and share ideas. And a big influence was Garvey's newspaper. I think it's the, it was the Negro World which was banned throughout the West Indies by the governors because, you know, Garvey was seen as such a dangerous agitator and so on. Um, but sailors brought in the newspaper and, and, and all the, the, um, the literature from the Garvey movement, and that was circulated through the UNIA. And, of course, a lot of communist literature was coming in as well. And so the, the UNIA served as a channel through which all these movements developed, the labor movement, the political movement, and so on and so forth. The post-war ideologies of nationalism and equality for all resonate from Europe to the Caribbean. Men of the British West Indies Regiment return with a fire for change in their hearts and minds. There were soldiers returning from the war who were very disappointed at the way they'd been treated by the British government because they volunteered, they went in the expectation that they would have been treated as equals with Br British troops and because of racism they were not. So they were very disgruntled during the war and after the war there were numerous race riots. So there was a lot of anger among these, these young men who had gone to fight for king and country and they were repatriated, they were sent back home with, with nothing, you know, the, the treatment was, was not what they expected. And so they were a very powerful factor in fueling the anger that built up in the Caribbean and, and exploded in, in the 30s. Weary of the growing tide of public unrest led by ex-servicemen, governments across the Caribbean announced various programs to find them jobs and land provisions for farming. But it takes years for some of these schemes to materialize and even then, they fail to meet expectations. In Jamaica, men were required to have at least £10 saved to be granted five acres of land, far more money than most people had access to. Additionally, the land provided was remote, with no roads and poor communication. In the end, only 72 veterans were able to access allotments of land, and of those, only three would inhabit the land for the five years necessary to earn the full title of the property. Across the Caribbean, land settlement schemes would meet similar fates. Cipriani had just returned, and unlike most of his white compatriots, he, had, um, he, he understood quite clearly the indignities being heaped upon his British West Indian Regiment soldiers. There, there, there was no indication that he had any political ambitions, no indication at all. But what, what had happened was he, he sincerely felt moved about the fact that so many men left their families behind, came back, met nothing, and their lives were in shambles, and they couldn't get any jobs, and he felt that these men should, as he said, being a land fit for heroes to live in. So, so that when he came back, even though he was white, one can say he declassed himself and decided that he was going to lead the, the black population. That's why they call him the barefoot leader, the barefoot man's leader, because he said, I'm a leader for, for, for the barefoot people. And that is how now Cipriani revives the Trinidad Working Men's Association so that immediately after the war, there is the beginning of the expression of this dissatisfaction that had grown among these black West Indian soldiers who had gone to fight for the mother country and fight for democracy. Now they come back really very angry. 
Following the riots, in 1922, the British government dispatches a one-man commission of inquiry to the Caribbean to investigate the post-war discontent and to recommend on future constitutional changes. As a result of the West Indian-wide disturbances just after the war, led by these returned soldiers, it was so, so widespread it was upsetting the economy to such an extent that the British saw the writing on the wall and in 1922 they sent a one-man commission, the Wood Commission, Colonel E.F.L. Wood, to the Caribbean, not to Trinidad alone. This is what, you know, I keep making the point, this is not a Trinidad thing alone, it's Caribbean-wide. So they sent him to the British Caribbean to go down all the islands from Jamaica to Guyana, including Trinidad, to find out, well, what's the problem? What's the problem? And one of the things he said is that these uh, political leaders have returned from the war. They have seen the operation of democracy in Britain. Their eyes have been opened by all the incidents of the war. And, and my advice to you, the British government, is that you have to open up the Crown Colony system so that uh, these people can at least begin to participate in, in governance. Middle class activists were agitating for elected members in the Legislative Council and for movement towards what we would describe as more self-government. In other words, more opportunities for local men, and I did say men, particularly men with some education, to vote for their Legislative Council and to take more part in running these colonies. So there was organization and of course, as we know, World War I greatly stimulated all those tendencies towards organization and claims for greater self-government and greater um, dignity for particularly the black and brown subjects of the empire in the Caribbean. In Trinidad, Arthur Cipriani meets with the one-man commissioner E.L.F. Wood to argue the case for a representative legislative body. Wood recommends that the Caribbean be granted limited political autonomy by making seven seats available for elected members in the legislature in each island. In 1925, when we had the first election in Trinidad, the very first election, 1925, where we are allowed to elect seven out of 25 representatives. And in that seven is Cipriani, who defeats a really very powerful Englishman and the oil pioneer of Trinidad, Randolph Rust. However, far from calming the situation in the Caribbean, Wood's visit and the resulting steps towards local representation further ignite a region now bent on change. The Caribbean leaders say, now that we have succeeded thus far in getting limited representative government, we must go for the whole hog. We must go for universal franchise. We must go for, for full elections in, 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 in the uh, Caribbean legislators. And one of the major results uh, of the First World War is the creation of a whole cadre of, of leaders throughout the Caribbean who then, who then take up the mantle of leadership and lead us straight into the greatest revolution we've had in the Caribbean, and that is the disturbances of 1937 and 38. Who won World War One? It is a good question. I mean, it was clear that in the trenches, the Allied forces prevailed. The British Empire did win the war but in doing so, it may inadvertently have shortened its own life because a lot of its subjects who were dragged willy-nilly off to fight on its behalf got a lot of ideas into their heads that the British Empire would have preferred they didn't, like about equality and equal access to human rights and jobs and being treated with respect and dignity. If they hadn't been taken off to theatres of war in Europe, and in the Middle East and so on, it might have taken maybe another decade or two before those ideas filtered through to them. One good thing that came out of it is that yes, it did help to speed up the process of self-awareness of West Indians. Those who went away saw 
what life was really like in the mother country, what, what English people enjoyed and had the right to that they didn't and didn't have any prospect of and they realized that nobody was going to give it to them for fighting in the war or anything else. They were going to have to take it. This was a catalyst for change. And so I think I could say that we won the war to a certain extent. That we, in fact, came out of it in a place where we were willing to say stop. We are no longer going to accept this and we demand change. And it was heard in a, a way that was different to in previous times. West Indians struggled to fight and die for the idea of a just and mighty empire of which they felt proud to belong. But the Great War would strip them of their naive innocence they would come to understand that to the British they were little more than small cogs working in a large machine. Wounded and angry veterans of the British West Indies Regiment would return to their homes and ignite a fire of change that would eventually lead to universal adult suffrage and independence for the once exploited islands of the Caribbean.